Hello everybody, my name is Cliff and welcome back to my channel. This is Cliff's Dark Gems. Today I'm going to be counting down my top 10 favorite novels, novellas, by one of my favorite authors, Clive Barker. Stay tuned. Okay everyone, so, so I said Clive Barker is one of my favourite authors. I have spoken about him in a number of other videos that I will link up above me at various stages. And I've spoken about some of these books as well. Now look, I've set myself some ground rules. Uh, no short stories, so I'm not going to be delving into the books of blood. And the reason for that is that I want to do a video later on about my favourite short stories by him. So you'll only find novels and novellas here. In addition to that, um, I'm not going to talk about sequels to these novels because uh, I want to get a bit of variety in this video. And so, yeah, let's begin. First off, I'm just going to give one special mention, and that is Mr. Begone, Begone by Clive Barker. Now, I didn't give this book anywhere near the love, perhaps I could have, and I need to give it a reread, it's very short. It's about a demon being imprisoned in within the pages of the book. And it's interestingly told from the demon's perspective. Now the one thing that is very interesting about this is that I can see that Clive Box is having a bit of fun with the narrative, with the narrative structure, and yeah, I'm going to give it another go. And then it might end up in my top 10. That is Mr. Begone. Okay, in 10th position we have the Scarlet Gospels. Now this was a book that definitely split opinion. A lot of people were very, very disappointed. Um, and it certainly did have its flaws. Um, there was for large parts of my reading of the book, I thought I would give it two or three stars. But there's something that really saved the book for me, and I'm going to come into that in a second. First of all, what's it about? Okay, well we have Harry Damore, who's a hero from previous uh, Clark Barker books. And we have Pinhead. Pinhead. Um, the Cenobite from Hell, and basically at the beginning of the book you have Pinhead who is absolutely destroying these magicians. He's ripping them apart. There's some such graphic violence. It is disturbing, it's disgusting, and it was a great way to start the book to be honest. Um, but then it kind of goes a little bit all over the place, and I'm not even going to bother going in with some of the other characters. But then what happens is that Pinhead captures um, Harry Damore, who's a sort of PI, is a detective of the supernatural, and he's got these tattoos all over his body that protect him from supernatural forces. And one of Harry's closest friends is uh, a blind a medium, and she gets kidnapped by a pinhead who is going off through hell. He is ambitious, he wants to take over hell, and he wants to confront the devil, Lucifer. And he wants Harry to go after him, to bear witness to his actions. Now, this is where the book gets very interesting for me, because Clive Barker, the way he describes hell, is majestically grotesque, and just in so much interesting detail of the buildings and of the hellish landscape, that you cannot help but be completely drawn in. The biggest weakness for me was the other characters. Um, oh, there's an assortment of other characters that travel with Harry and they are just so unlikable. I really didn't care for them. In fact, they irritate, irritated the hell out of me and I wish they would just die. I wish that some of these things that were in hell would just kill them off. Uh, but as I said, the description of hell is so interesting, of the buildings and of the place. It's just so interesting, and I was really drawn into, drawn into that. And there's enough of the gore and the horror and just interesting creatures that made me made this book a four star for me. Perhaps a three and a half to a four star, but I really enjoyed that. And the final, the end of the book, and the actual battle between Pinhead and uh, Lucifer was very, very, very interesting for me. I hope I'm not giving away too many spoilers here, but really, it's, worth, it's a book worth reading, even if you 
absolutely love the Hellraiser. It might disappoint you a little bit, but I found it very interesting. And that's why it's in 10th position. That is the Scarlet Gospels. Okay, ninth position we have a very interesting little novella. Well, I think it's a little bit short, a little bit long to be called a novella, and that is Cabal, which was turned into the movie Nightbreed, which is fantastic. And this is an excellent little blend of fantasy and horror, where you have this character Boone, who is tormented, and he believes himself to be a terrible serial killer, and he goes to his psychiatrist to convince us convinces him to turn himself in, but he's actually setting him up because the psychiatrist Dexter, I believe his name is Dexter, is a serial killer. Now Boone escapes and he ends up in a place called Midian, Midian which is a very strange uh, sort of crypt area and he meets these creatures called the Nightbreed who are shapeshifters and they're monsters. But what's very, very interesting about this story is that we have to question who the real monsters are. Is it the Nightbreed or is it the humans, the cops and the serial killer who is out to get them? Um, and you can't help feeling sympathy for these creatures because all they really want to do is just live in peace, and find their place in the world and this doesn't happen. Uh, so there's a very intriguing, intriguing little story, well told, fast paced and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and that is Cabal in ninth position. Okay, next up is in eighth position. That's right, eighth position. We're going to talk about two, the first of two YA novels that uh, Clive Barker has written. But when I say YA, you need to remember that these novels are also very suitable for adults. There's still a lot of trademark Clive Barker horror and thrills and chills, and so don't be put up when I say YA. Now this first one is magical and it's called The Thief of Always. Now, I don't have the original, this is a graphic novel, um, beautifully, beautiful drawings. And yeah, this book is magical in so many ways. It is about a young boy, Henry Swick, who is basically bored out of his skull. It's raining outside, he hates his life. And he gets the opportunity, with a strange creature, a strange visitor tells him at night that he must come and visit this holiday house, Mr. Hood's holiday house, where all his dreams will come true. Uh, so he pays a visit to this house. And it seems very magical at first. Uh, there's Halloween every day, there's Christmas every day. Everything seems just perfect. Right? Wrong. And he basically soon discovers that this house is not everything that it's cracked off to be. Now, I cannot help drawing parallels between this story and another YA that I absolutely adore by Neil Gaiman called Coraline. Because one of the major themes in both, in both stories is be careful what you wish for. And this would be for adults and for, for children. Is that you always think that your life is um, going to be better off somewhere else. Oh, your life is terrible and you wish it to change. And instead of just living your life in the present, living your life in the moment. In Coraline, something similar happens. She's bored out of her skull. Her parents aren't paying any attention to her. And it's raining and she's grumpy. They've just moved into this house. And she finds a doorway into an alternative universe where there's an alternative mother and father. So there are some very, very strong parallels between these two stories. And really, they're just both magical tales. I would say that uh, The Thief of Always is a lot darker, but that's just me. Um, and it's a great Clive Barker story. Maybe for those of you that don't want your horror too dark. Okay, in seventh position we have Clive Barker's de debut novel called The Damnation Game. And this came on the back of his successful Books of Blood. And I think this was a pretty damn good debut. And it starts off with this thief walking through the streets of Poland that is basically after World War II, so it's a completely demolished Poland. And there's some very, very grotesque, terrible things that are happening around him. But this thief is in search of a card player. Now this card player is famous for having never lost a card game. And he finds a card player and they begin their game. Fast forward, we get a guy called Whitehouse, who is a millionaire. He's very rich, he's very wealthy. 
and he hires a con as a bodyguard, and I think that's Marty, and takes him back to his mansion, which is very, very well secured. And things are not what they seem. And how did White House get his riches and wealth and fame? That's because he won the card game. He was a thief, and he exchanged all of that for his immortal soul. Now, this is a Faustian tale, but it doesn't involve the devil. The other, the antagonist, if you will, is a Mamolian. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly, but he's almost like a he's a mortal with supernatural powers. He can raise the dead. That comes into the story later. Now, there are some very serious flaws with this novel. I found the pacing a little bit off, but as a debut novel, it was very strong. And I loved the characters, even though they were very grey characters. And all of them were pretty messed up in some way. Uh, White House's daughter is a drug addict. Um, and there's just, there's just a stunning array of really screwed up characters. The themes, the whole tone of the story is very, very bleak, very dark, very disturbing. Uh, there are some graphical scenes of violence. And oh, there are some graphical scenes of violence against animals. Trigger warning, if you have a problem with that, if you're a dog lover in particular, you might want to give this a skip. I also really enjoyed the soup. There was a little bit of a supernatural aspect as well. And he really turned that on its head. Very, very interesting. And I loved his depiction of hell. Um, and I actually want to read you something. Because... Right at the beginning of the novel, before the first chapter, Clive Barker quotes uh, W.B. Yeats, Yeats, and he says, Hell is the place of those who have denied. They find there what they planted and what dug, a lake of spaces and a wood of nothing, and wander there and drift and never cease wailing for substance. It's just the idea that hell is nothing. There's nothing there. And there's no substance. And this comes into the, the novel a little bit later. And I found it very powerful. But really it's a story about power and ego, egos. And how this man will not give up what he's promised. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a brutal tale. As I said, it's very dark. Very grim. But I thoroughly enjoyed most of it. So it comes in at number seven. The Damnation Game. In sixth place we have our second uh, YA novel but I would say that this appeals far more to adults as well with some of the imagery and that is Aberat and unfortunately I no longer have a copy but this is a mishmash of fantasy, horror, all sorts of different elements and it really shows Clive Barker at his most imaginative and he's most detailed in creating these creatures and these lands and this setup. Okay, what's it about? Well, we got our heroine, a young girl called Candy Quakenbush, who basically is bored of her life in Chicken Town. Yes, that's right, Chicken Town. And she's bored of school. Fortunately for her, she gets taken away by a wave, and she finds herself in this archipelago of islands. Now, these islands are called the Aberrant. And every single island is a different hour on the clock and is representative of that hour with the creatures and the settings and the goings on. So you have from 1 a.m. to 12 p.m. Now obviously my favorite island is 12 p.m. midnight and that is where you find some truly grotesque things happening and you've got this guy called Christopher Carrion who controls the island He's a despicable creature and he's got big plans basically to take over the Aberrant and basically make sure Midnight conquers all. And this is such a wonderful novel. And it's also a follow-up. It's, it's actually part of a trilogy. I've read the whole trilogy and I really, really love it. And I'd recommend it even if you are an adult and you're not into YA because just he's just shows you the vastness of this man's imagination and really all the drawings that he does because it's illustrated all the illustrations are done by Clive Barker himself and it's just a fantastic tale give it a go that is Aberrant
Next up we have in fifth position the Hellbound Heart. Now this gruesome little novella is famous for spawning perhaps Clive Barker's most famous film, most definitely his famous film, and most de definitely his famous villain, and that is Hellraiser and Pinhead, the Cenobite from Hell, or from wherever the hell he's from. But this is a gruesome tale, um, I have mentioned it before, but it's about Frank, and Frank wants to explore the boundaries of the pleasures of the flesh. And he finds a little wooden puzzle box and he's sitting in a room and he manages to open up this puzzle box which opens up this world and he hopes this is going to transport him to the deepest pleasure but unfortunately he's visited by these creatures called Cenobites and their idea of pleasure is not something that he would rather understand he goes through a lot and a lot of pain he gets ripped to pieces. Now this is a gruesome little novella, very well written. There is some graphic body horror and it doesn't stop at this thing where he is basically, I'm not going to go into the details, I don't want to spoil it. There's an excellent storyline. Um, the characters are kind of hateful, especially the girlfriend. And uh, as I say, it gets gruesome and it builds to an awesome climax. Uh, but yeah, this is Hellbound Heart, and I strongly recommend you read it. I haven't, I've watched Hellraiser once, and I think I'll definitely give it another viewing. I think a lot of people prefer the movie to the book, but yeah, I really enjoyed this Hellbound Heart. Okay everyone, this next one, Cold Heart Canyon, is in my top 10 horror novels of all time. I think third video that I've ever done. But it's not there for a reason that I'll explain a bit later. And this is a truly horrifying novel, and he really goes back to his roots in this one. It's sexually depraved, um, and when I say depraved, I mean you won't read anything quite like it. So trigger warning, he goes to places sexually that you, never mind s &M, he goes to places you might not be comfortable with, just to say that off the bat. However, there's also a lot of sort of emotional resonance or just as a sense of emotion in the story and that's because he wrote it after his father died tragically and so it's almost like he's dealing with his grief and it comes through in the story. So what's it about? Okay well you have this Hollywood star who's aging at least in his own mind he's not getting the roles that he used to get and he undergoes plastic surgery in order to try and regain his good looks. Unfortunately, this guy, Todd Pickett, the surgery goes horribly wrong and he has to be secreted away from the public eye and he finds himself in this mansion in Cold Heart, Cold Heart Canyon where no one can find him unless you know where it is. And this mansion is basically, I'm not, I've spoken about this already so I'm going to keep it quite short in terms of the plot, the mansion is haunted by ghosts and these are the ghosts of Hollywood's past. The, silver age of Hollywood and they are debauched ghosts they are messed up and we, we learn I'm going to just go into my favorite part of the whole novel that there is a room in the basement that contains these millions of tiles thousands of tiles that have been put together and they form this other world called the devil's country now this is the part of the novel that really 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 appealed to me and in the beginning of the novel we see how these tiles happen to be in this, in this mansion and we learn why all these ghosts are coming back to this mansion and they're not able to sort of move, move off in peace or whatever. It's because once you get a glimpse of this devil's country you just keep coming back. Now this is a fantastic horror novel and as I say sexually depraved as well but there's so much more to it than that. And it kind of finishes in a strange note, a kind of a low-key note, but I thought it was actually very, very well done. Um, considering what Clive Barker was going through, this is a different kind of horror novel that he's written. And I thoroughly enjoyed myself. That is Cold Heart Canyon. Okay, before I turn to my top three, I have to say that these three novels have absolutely enchanted and blown away many readers on the one hand, and on the other hand really pissed off a lot of Clive Barker's fans. 
because they are labeled as dark fantasy. Now, I don't know about this whole genre thing, but believe me when I say that these novels have plenty of horror and grotesqueness and Clive Barker's horrific imagination in the pages. And it's, it's almost like he writes neither horror or fantasy, but he brings them together in such a way, in such a skillful, beautiful way, that you can only call them a Clive Barker novel. Not a horror novel, not a fantasy novel, a true, quintessential Clive Barker novel. You cannot read anything else like this. There is no other author I've found that can write like this in these top three novels. And so, let's talk about them now. In third position, we have The Great and Secret Show. Now, this is an epic, complex, multi-layered masterpiece. Uh, it's many people's favorite. I'm going to show you my top two just now. But it is almost too complex to talk about in terms of the plot. Um, because it's basically almost an Armageddon kind of thing. Uh, a battle that takes place over generations. But let me just tell you how it starts. Right? It starts off with a man called Randolph Jeff. Jeff. Oh, excuse me. Randolph Jeff. And he is uh, a nobody and he works in a post office in the dead letter office of a post office where nobody wants to be where basically there are thousands of letters that have been undelivered, that are unwanted, from all walks of life, from all kinds of people. Um, letters that are threatening, letters that, I think he describes a letter where an ex-lover posts a pu bit of his pubic hair to his lover. There's just everything in these letters. And he spends his time sitting on the floor going through these letters. Now that I tell you he's not liked by his colleagues, colleagues or his boss, so he's, he has a seething hatred and revenge within him as well. And when he opens these letters, he starts to discover the secrets of society, the secrets underlying the world. And he starts to piece these things together. And let's just say that he gets out of that po dead post office box office, and he goes off and seeks his own destiny. And that leads to the story and the discovery of this thing called the art. Now, I don't want to go into it anymore. It's super complex. I could give a full review of this in about 20-30 minutes. But it's just so many beautiful themes. Um, there's love, there's death, there's sex. Plenty of sex in all of these three books. But yeah, just a wonderful feast for the imagination that is the great and secret show. Oh, and I forgot to say, there's also a sequel for this one called Everville, which is also a beautiful novel in its own right. I would remember I said I'm not going to, do, to rank them separately. I just want to show them as one novel. That's Everville. Right, coming in at over a thousand pages, and in fact in two separate parts, so probably closer to two thousand pages, is Imagica. And this is perhaps the most <laughs> just awe-inspiring just lengthy, just crazy, epic thing that Cloud Bark has ever done. It's hard to describe, but let's give it a go. Now, Magica is like the universe, and the universe has five dominions. We are the fifth dominion, Earth. So the other four dominions are other worlds, separate, separate to ours, but lying sort of beside, beside ours. And we cut off from the rest of the Magica, and we cut off for reasons that I'm not going to spoil, you can read the book. But basically, every now and then there is an attempt to bring the Imagica together, to reconcile all the worlds together to form the Imagica. And up until now, those have failed miserably. So, basically, this book, and I'm not going to go anything more into this plot, there are some very, very interesting characters. We got one character in, oh wow, he's called Pio Pai, and he's a shape-shifting, gender-shifting assassin, bit of a sex maniac. In fact, this book also has some very depraved sex scenes, but I don't know, they're kind of gratuitous, but the story does keep going forward anyway. I think Clive Barker, when he, read, when he wrote this book, he said that he felt he was getting lost. And he really struggled to finish his book. He struggled to find, to bring the threads together, 
he almost quit writing his book. Uh, that's how fast it is. And that's why I don't want to talk about plot, because you can't. You ha Basically, I'd have to sit down and actually talk about this novel over about an hour. It is so complex. Um, and that's why I don't think many people try and review this. But it is magical. Magical characters, magical worlds, magical creatures, incredibly um, well-written gods, monsters, and just an epic scope and a variety of stuff that happens in this book. That it's almost mind-boggling what he achieves here. And you have to read it for yourself. I think it's only in second position because the book in first position is just so dear to me. That is Magica. Oh, and once again I forgot to mention uh, the follow-up to Magica, The Reconciliation, Magica Part 2. There was supposed to be a Part 3, I think, but that just never happened. But this is also very long, but magical. That is Reconciliation. In my number one position, and if you've been watching my channel, it's no surprise, is Weevil. Now, this is a book that I was completely immersed in. I was never bored with. It excited my senses. It made me feel alive in ways that I never had before. Perhaps it's because it's the first book um, by Clive Barker I'd ever read, and also the first fantasy book, or one of the first fantasy books that I've ever read, and with the horror and the fantasy and the fact that this is the quintessential Clive Barker novel, it just absolutely blew me away. Now, I did a full review on this book, so I'm not going to talk about the plot and everything. I've spoken about it, I think, two, three times during my channel. I will link it above if you really want to hear about it. But I do want to talk about one of the themes that really resonates with me. And in order to do that, we do need to talk about the beginning of the book, where we have a character called Cal. And now Cal is looking after his dad's homing pigeon, pigeons. Cal is bored with life. He doesn't like his dull, boring life. It's mundane, it's grey, and he's a bit of a dreamer. And while he's dreaming and daydreaming, one of the birds gets out. Cal sends off, goes off in pursuit of this bird, which joins this huge flock of birds up in the air. And they descend towards this sort of derelict house, not derelict, but it's been kind of cleared out. And Cal races after desperate to try and find his homing pigeon so that he can return it safely to his dad who might be a little bit pissed off that he lost it. And he gets to this house and he finds that he has to climb up this wall to try and get to the pigeon. Now what actually happens is as he's doing that these men come out with this carpet, unravel the carpet and as Cal gets to the top of the wall he falls. He slips and falls and he falls head down towards the carpet and as he falls he is transported into this magical world where everything just comes alive to him and the way Clive Barker does this is just the prose is just so gorgeous describing uh, this landscape and obviously it takes maybe two three seconds before he hits the ground hits the carpet but in that time as he says later as he states I have seen Wonderland I have seen the magic. Now, the reason I tell you this is because one of the central themes in this novel is magic and how magic is important to our lives. Uh, magic and wonder transports our lives. And the fact that so often in this novel you have this world and then you have the real world. And then you have this world and the real world. Clive Barker is saying that we lose sight of wonder. We lose sight of the magic because we'd be too busy leading a boring day-to-day -day life. And that, I think, even going further than that, he's trying to talk about the importance of genre, of fantastical genre. And I don't think he means just horror or fantasy here. I think he means all of the fantastical genre, horror, fantasy, these things that transport us. And I think he's saying in a way that this actually has healing properties. This is stuff that heals us. Uh, being an escape, having an escape into these worlds takes us away from the trials and tribulations of real life for a bit. This is not just the thing about a novel. This is the thing about us as human beings. 
that we need to experience these, these things to keep the magic and the wonder inside of us alive. And that's why it's so important. And this book changed me. It changed me. It actually, first I've read it, I think two, three times, maybe three times. And every time I read it, it just becomes just more unbelievable. The difference between this one as well and the other two that I mentioned is that this book, I was never bored. It's over 700, 800 pages and it's thrilling as well. He keeps you reading. It's not something that uh, kind of the plot goes all over the place. He really keeps you, it's gripping, it's magical. And yeah, if you're going to read one Clive Barker book, I would recommend Ah, Weevil. And look at the back of this cover as well. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? And this actually tells us something about the plot as well. I'm not going to tell you, but yeah, this is my prize book position, that's for sure. That is Weevil. Okay, everyone, but before we go, I would just like to read a couple of my favorite Clive Barker quotes from some of his work, but also stuff that he just spoke generally. He's done so many interviews. Uh, you can actually visit his website. It's got so many things that he said about the world, about books, about his own work. And he's, as you know, he's also a painter and he's a playwright and he does other stuff as well. But it's just very quickly a couple of these quotes that you might enjoy. First one. All I've ever wanted to do is darken the day and brighten the night. And then talks about writing. The whole point about vision is that it's very individual, it's very personal, and it has to be confessional. It has to be something which hurts. It has to be the pulling out of it and cutting on the page hurts. You either write with your own blood or nobody's, otherwise it's just ink. Okay, that's pretty awesome. Another couple of short ones. The sun rose like a stripper, keeping its glory well covered by cloud. Till it seemed like there'd be no show at all. Next thing, and this was a true experience of Clive Barker. I held a brain in my hand, which is an extraordinary experience. He actually visited a morgue. Next one, last one, my favorite Clive Barker quote. Any fool can be happy. It takes a man with real heart to make beauty out of the stuff that makes us weep. Right, here we go. Okay everyone, so that comes to the end of the video. I really hope you enjoyed that. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed my content. And yeah, well till next time. Also leave a comment down below. Uh, do you enjoy Clive Barker? Which Clive Barkers have you, have you read? Um, which were your favorite? But anyway, please feel sure to like and subscribe and take care of yourselves and I'll see you all next time. Keep those pages turning. Cheers.